Hey everybody, it's Hawk here, and today I'm doing something a little bit different on this series. Uh, where normally I talk about creatures in a very broad uh, context, like when I spoke about trolls, I didn't go into the super details about the individual subspecies. This one, though, I'm speaking about a very particular creature, and as you've seen by the title, it is the White Dragon from D&D. Now, the reason I'm doing this instead of talking about just dragons is because A, dragons is a stupidly massive umbrella term that encompasses a whole lot of things that you wouldn't necessarily consider a dragon in the classical European sense. I mean, a giant magical snake could very easily qualify as a dragon. Okay, it's a pretty broad categorization. So, I'm doing it partially on that uh, part front, but I'm also speaking specifically about the White Dragon because I honestly feel the White Dragon is very much underappreciated and underfeared, just in a general sense. So, how about I just go into some stats about the White Dragon. Now, key note here is the White Dragon is from D&D. Now, there are dragons that are white in mythology, but the white dragon that we know of, where it's kind of dumb, very vicious, breathes f uh, freezing air, or nitrogen, honestly, if you want to go up that path, it breathes cold at things. It's from D&D slash Pathfinder, so D&D originally and Pathfinder uh, via adoption. And anything that comes out of Anything that has that, it came out of d and I don't know of anything older than this. There might be some pulp stories I didn't know about, but generally speaking, that's where everyone's going to know it from. So, the White Dragon, as I've already alluded to, is generally considered stupid. It's the dumbest of all the dragons. It's still smart. Uh, in D&D, a Wormling Dragon has an int of 6. 3.5, specifically, sorry. I'll be using that as my Ben's line. I, I know in 4E and 5E the sizes have changed, but I'm going by 3.5 just to make my point. It won't be difficult. You can just adjust the sizes accordingly. And the stats aren't too different. So it's kind of dumb. Int of 6. Is, int of 10 is considered average. And average orc is an 8. So it's dumber than your average orc. That's not that dumb. I mean, it's smarter than anim an animal by a fairly considerable margin. So that's definitely something to work off of. And it's the size of a cat. Well, that big. Add the tail in there, it's like this. Add some wings in there, it's much bigger. It's a flying house cat. That is an ice thrower. It's got a, it's a fairly large cone on that thing that just freezing gas comes flying out of it. In this monstrous cone, which can do a significant amount of damage for a creature of its size. We wouldn't actually expect this. So, they got that. They're, in the case of a wormling, they're quite small. And white dragons are generally small all the way, uh, even once they're extremely old. They got about a gargantuan in 3.5. So other abilities they have, they don't have great spellcasting progression, but it is there. They have freezing fog as an ability, so they create a really cold mist that causes a thin layer of ice to form on the ground, making it exceedingly difficult to move around. It's a hell of a combination effect. Uh, anything that is ice they can climb on without any issues, like a spider climb effect, so they can just crawl over anything where they live. It's not a big deal to them. They can fly, they can run, they can burrow, they can swim. They will come at you from... The only thing they're missing is a literal climb speed, and ice walking kind of gives them one. It, it, it's a, you know, conditional, but it doesn't matter for them in the most part. Beyond that, they don't have anything super crazy in comparison to other dragons. They're just fairly tough, a little on the dumb side, and have some unique and interesting powers for themselves. But I'm not going to tell you about why they are probably the most terrifying dragon you're ever going to meet, and I'm going to do this through their life stages so you can kind of get a concept here. So as I said, when they're a wormling and they're very young, so when they're from tiny, the size of a cat, up to medium, uh, just before medium size, so tiny to small. So they go from a cat to a small dog. Might even be a little too big for that one, but you know what I mean, they, they don't get very big. They act much like a bird of prey. They'll live in a tree, they'll live on crocky crags, things of that nature, and they will hunt primarily aerially. This is because they have no reason to try to fight on the ground, while they could totally win fights with wolves and uh, possibly deer and things. 
they have wings, so they should take full advantage of this. They are smart enough to realize this, and honestly getting into competition with the ground-based animals that they have to deal with, like winter wolves, which are immune to their uh, breath weapons, or frost trolls, or yetis, things that are highly resistant to cold, is a very bad, uh, very, very bad idea for them. Now, so they'll fly around, again, like hawks and owls and things, and mostly it'll be going after small things, hares and possibly small wolves or fawns. They'll swoop in, hit them with their breath weapon, tackle them to the ground, and then either, if it's small enough, fly off with it, or if it's too big, drag it somewhere a little safer, probably into a snowdrift, and then stash it for later or just eat it right then and there. Now from there, in this inst in, in, this, in this age, they're probably not going to have a very secure singular area. They'll have a small lair, and then they'll stay there for the most part. But generally, they'll be doing lots of roaming. They've got great movement capacity, it's not a big deal for them, and they're completely immune to the cold, so they could just stay out in the middle of a blizzard without a care in the world. They can also burrow, so rabbits aren't safe in their burrow from them. So they're sort of like a combination of carnivorous badger, a hawk, and a lynx, kind of all rolled into one little crazy package. Now once they get to the size of medium, so about the size of a wolf, they run into a rather big problem. Most trees will not be able to support their weight anymore. Now, if they're living uh, in an area that's a bunch of rocky hills, or canyons, or cliffs, or by the ocean, for that matter, they'll just keep doing what they're doing. There's no reason to change, they'll keep flying. Now, I'm alluding to the ocean, I'll get into that in a second. But if medium ones who aren't immediately next to the ocean, or a large body of water, will now transition to a more big cat style of ambush pre uh, predating. So they'll act more like a tiger in this instance. They are fairly stealthy, they blend in quite well with their snowy environment. Um, when the snow melts, it's a bit of a problem, but it's not a huge insurmountable issue, because again, they can burrow, they can swim, and they can fly. So what they'll do is they'll hide, and then they'll wait for something to come by, and again, they're completely immune to the cold, so they can literally just sit in a snowbank all day and just conserve energy by just sitting there and doing nothing. And then when something gets near enough, they can leap out, immediately leap into a flight, and then dive into it and take it out, and continue on that way. So this is pretty simple. So right now, we're talking about, in D&D terms, a dragon is about 200 or 300 years old, and it has quite literally never been the top of the food chain here. It is still, at this stage, as being, now, well, again, the medium-sized one, so I believe that's young adult at this stage, that might be juvenile yet, I'm not 100% remembering this, but when they're medium, they're still being out-competed, weight for weight, by winter wolves and other particularly large predators up in the north. Now there's more than just winter wolves, but I'm using them as the example because they're immune to cold. So a white dragon cannot punch upwards like other dragons can with its breath weapon. A red dragon up in the mountains could totally go up against anything that's not a fire giant because everything else is not immune to fire. There's not necessarily a bunch of things that live in the mountains that are immune to fire. Depending on where they are, that could be the case. Or blue dragons are another excellent example. Where they live in the desert. What the heck's immune to electricity out there? Yeah, you could probably get a, a list of things that could conceivably be there, but they blue dragons could just avoid them and go deal with other things. It's not a big problem. Similar to green dragons. The only one similar to this is the black dragon who lives in the swamp. Now, it's not very large either, and it has a similar thing going on. It, however, went the other direction, whereas white dragons are going with ferocity, the black dragon is going with deception and intelligence, because its breath weapon also is somewhat stopped by some of the uh, residents of the swamp. They're a little more acidically resistant than other things, but the white dragon has it worse, which is why it has to keep doing these things, which is why it has to act more like an animal. It can't constantly just do strafing runs with its breath weapons, and that won't necessarily work. Now, it does work on a lot of things. So it can actually do uh, be a very successful hunter with this. It can get fairly large animals with its breath weapon. The problem is, winter wolves also do this, so it has to be careful about what it's doing. So while it's continuing to be a, a large cat and not doing the free roaming thing because that's what wolves do and it doesn't need to get into competition with a pack of wolves, while it'll probably win, it doesn't need to take that kind of damage getting into that sort of fight. So it's spent a couple hundred years of its for, of its life being a large tiger, not doing a lot of social niceties, not talking to a lot of things, not really being educated on much of anything, just 
surviving in a fairly brutalistic fashion. Now this gives white dragons that savage primal edge to them. That's why they're not really considered smart. Because honestly, they don't think that way. They don't think about things in books and statistics and large numbers and communal stuff like that. They think about it as, can I eat that? And how hard is it to be to kill it to eat it? That's how their brain's wired. Because it has to be, because of where they live. Because now they go, now that they're large, and now they're, you know, young adults and moving into that area, now they have to go to the ocean. Unless there's large herds of mammoths or other particularly large ground creatures, they kind of have to go to the ocean, because that's where the big things are. Now this is where they go back to flying again. And honestly, this works with both of them. They'll probably go back to flying again anyway. It's just more convenient when you're this big. Now in the ocean, and this is also true for all sizes downwards, it'll just scale it slightly depending on what they're going after, where you can have access to seals, beluga whales, orcas, other whales. There's all sorts of whales and big things made out of meat floating in the ocean, which is fantastic for the white dragon. It is glorious. The issue is now you're dealing with frost giants. And that's the same problem you get if you run over into the mammoths. The frost giants are probably taking them. Now, this is not true if there are not frost giants in your frozen north, but frankly, D&D kind of calls it out directly. Frost giants will capture white dragons and use them as guard dogs. Like, they explicitly state that in there. So I'm using that as my baseline assumption. If that's not the case, this will change. But I'm just going with the baseline here. So they'll go hunt whales and seals and things. And that's why, if they live in a, on the rocky shore, they have a much better chance, a much better early childhood, as it were, because it's much easier to get things. And they can just go in the ocean and go catch fish. It's much easier if they're living on a sort of shoreline. However, you can only imagine the competition they're going to run into from other white dragons in this instance. And white dragons, the only way they fight each other is by literally beating the crap out of each other. It's really rough. So, once they're doing that, and they are not being captured by frost giants, so the ones that don't get captured by frost giants and continue to exist are now huge. So they've now gone up another size category. They're now older. So we're talking six, seven hundred years old here. They are now finally blissfully at the top of the food chain. Finally, because they're bigger than frost giants, they're tougher than frost giants, and the frost giants are they're, they're, they're going to back off, because it doesn't matter that they're immune to the breath, but by this point, either the frost, either the white dragon has found a way to utilize its breath weapon, as in it's taken a energy substitution feat or a pierce immunity combination of feats, it's gotten something that allows it to use its breath weapon in some fashion. Or it's just not, and has gone whole hog into rip and tear until it is done. Which is terrifying, because dragons are really good at that in d and I mean, think about it. You've got this monstrous, size of a medieval house dragon. It's got claws on both of its legs, fully capable of rearing back. It's got a mouthful of teeth. It can smack you with its wings, because those are actually fairly durable. And it's got this big honking tail to beat you with. And it's smart enough to know that. It is smart enough to use all of these things. On top of its magic, on top of its multiple movement speeds. I mean, a white dragon, even white dragon, is as likely to dive out of the ocean and attack you Jaws style as it is to dive bomb you from the sky, as it is to do a Tremors impression and pounce out of the ground. And all of this is at least as fast as your average horse. If not faster, depending on the horse breed. Put that in perspective here. So now, at 700 or so years old, they're finally at the top of the food chain. They finally made it. And now you go up to the main gargantuan. They're just hammering that point home. When you enter a white dragon territory, that is their turf. They have fought for it with blood, sweat, and tears. Probably not tears, because that's a waste of water, and I don't know if dragons sweat, but you understand what I mean. They have fought for it with everything they have, and they are alive after a thousand years. That is theirs. Good luck taking it from them. As you gotta remember here, it's not a thousand years of, well, I'm just so big I get to be in charge, like red dragons, or I just have lightning breath, like a blue dragon, or I'll just poison you, like a green dragon. The black dragon's the closest one that kind of gets it. They're got it, though, with, um... Subtlety, deception, trickery, whereas the white dragon is doing it via a combination of stealth 
ambush and outright brutality. Because that's all it's got going for it. Because it can't use its breath weapon half the time. And honestly, after a point, it might just give up. Because it can't be certain what's going to work on it or not. All it takes is surviving one instance with a Winter Wolf for it to go, this might be a bad idea, I'm going to stop using this unless I'm positive it works. So it will only use it on very specific targets. But then you have the fact that it has its innate magic. Now it's using that to its fullest extent. God only knows what powers it's going to manifest to use for itself. It's a long list of arcane powers. And I think most of them are going to help it kill you better! So something like Bloodwind, where it's got ranged natural attacks now. Or... Um, various other movement debuffs or things of that nature to kill you easier to make its job that much better. But again, every white dragon is incredibly unique in this regard because each one has come up with its own particular method of survival, completely tailor-made to its environment. And that's why it's so terrifying. Red dragons can kind of be generalized. They're the ego dragon. They're arrogance incarnate. They're these big, honking, muscle-bound jerks who just rule the area by being. And it makes sense. They're huge. They're really big right out of the gate. I mean, they hatch. They are the size of a wolf. Like, they rear up on their back legs. The thing's as tall as I am, not counting the wing spread yet. It's big. And it's got a nasty breath weapon and an awful lot of power behind it. The White Dragon's not. The White Dragon is small, and it's could totally be killed by a bear. Like, a bear versus a wormling, the bear's probably going to win this. Now, if the Wormling's smart enough to utilize its high mobility, then it'll be fine, but it has to be smart enough to know that. It has to have figured that out by now. And if that doesn't happen, it just dies. So that's what happens here. You are left with the nastiest, the smartest, the most conniving, the most brutal white dragons are the ones that reach all the way to Great Worm. And my god, I don't want to fight that thing. I do not want to deal with a slasher killer the size of a house. Because that's what you're running into right now. And now we're going to talk about its horde. Okay? This is not something that's generally talked about. I don't really talk about treasure, but with dragons, it's kind of integral. Why do they have a horde? I don't know why dragons collect things, other than maybe they just think they're cool and kind of shiny. But that's the thing. Why would a white dragon do that? White dragons are all about survival. It's that pure primal need to live and keep going that is why they're so dangerous. So why does it have a horde? Well, there's two reasons. One, a horde is a sign to itself and to everything that can see that I am so amazing, I am so powerful, I am so in charge now that I can do frivolous stuff like this. I am so powerful, I am so clearly in command of my terrain that I can just have a pile of useless junk. Or just things they like, anyway. The other one is that all of that, except it's to signal for mating. It's, look at this. Look at how impressive I am. Look at what I have. And it's even more impressive than you probably think, because you're in the frozen north, so you're in Siberia. Or you're in northern Alaska, or northern Canada. Any of you who know what that looks like, and I will have a picture of something appropriate here, you know there's not a lot there. You hit a point where there are no more trees. Just, the trees just stop after a while. And even when there is trees, okay, I mean, there might be gold. I mean, we found gold up in Alaska, so there's lots of gold there, but there needs to be people to dig it out. Because the dragon ain't doing it himself. Or herself. So, what are you doing? You think... Frost Giants are going to mine? They're not really known for mining, not generally. And Frost Giants also like collecting things. They like showing off wealth. They like showing off their own power. So now the White Dragon's competing with something else that has a sort of hoarding propensity. So that means that that hoard that White Dragon has accumulated, even if it's not all that impressive, even if it's only a, a small pile of bronze and copper coins and some swords and suits of armor from barrows and whatnot, even if it's not super impressive monetarily, you have to remember that like everything else the White Dragon has done, it has been won through blood and suffering and wrath. It values that pile more than you possibly know. Now, Smaug has his giant hoard of dwarven gold, and that would be your average Red Dragon. Or maybe not average, but a very successful red dragon. 
A very successful white dragon probably doesn't have even one twentieth of that pile. Doesn't have anywhere near that scale. But it doesn't matter to the white dragon. Because to the white dragon, that massive pile is unattainable. It, it's, a, it's like going to the sun and bringing that down. It, it's not going to happen. But what is attainable is their pile of coins that they have worked so hard to get. Yeah, it's only, you know, a couple thousand gold. But that's not the point. It's theirs. And up in this frozen wasteland, they earned it. And you aren't taking that from them. So know that. When you're taking their hoard, you are taking something far more exceedingly value than just money. This isn't a dragon that can just go out and replace that fairly easily. That is difficult. That is hard. It could have taken them a century to pile that up. So think about that, and think of how incredibly pissed off they're going to be that you took that from them. Even one little piece. Okay, you took that one diamond. It's only one diamond. Oh, you can bet that that dragon knows where that one piece is. Now, this is true, generally speaking, for all dragons, but white dragons in particular are really going to want that back. And they're going to do it over your broken corpse, because they don't care. So now we get into the part of how do you fight a white dragon? Well, that's the fun part. You really don't want to, okay? Now, they're generally described in the books as dumb, bestial, savage, etc. You're doing that wrong if, that, if they're just dumb, lumbering idiots. Think of it this way. Think of how smart a tiger is in the real world. Okay? Think about that. Put that in your head. Tigers are pretty smart. They're very clever. I mean, there's a story of a tiger that once got shot by a uh, hunter, found the guy's hunting cabin, waited for it, waited for him in the thing, and then killed him when he walked through the door. That's what you're dealing with here. Okay? Now it's big, scaly, and white. And can dig through the ground, fly through the air, and swim through the ocean at a speed rivaling that of a horse in all of them, except flight, where it can fly at several times the speed of a horse running. Have fun with that. Don't get involved with these things unless you are absolutely confident. Now, the obvious solution is fire. Fire is your friend. Burning it. Burning it works great, except for those white dragons that are resistant to fire because, well, they took that feet chain. Again, White dragons are, or should be, all extremely customized. They should all be very different from one another. They should be unique. As long as the area has to do with it. Now, if you have run into two dragons that live on an ocean, on a cliff face facing the ocean, they're probably going to have fairly similar survival strategies overall, but they will, of course, have differences between the two of them. But generally speaking, a white dragon, one white dragon should not be identical to another one. Like, we're not even talking just, oh, one feature. You know, we're talking like they should have almost completely different builds inside of mechanics. Because they're that different because of just what they are. Because of how they have to live. Red dragons can be a little more averaged out, so can the other ones, because they can have a fairly generalized survival strategy, whereas white dragons don't get to have that luxury. So fire, generally speaking, is your solution. And even if, unless they've got a magic item, which they might, watch out for that. Uh, burning them is fine, any sort of elemental attacks are fine, as long as they're not cold. Um, don't fight him in his own lair. Don't do that. Because it'll be covered in ice, and then they'll start digging through the hole, they'll start digging in tunnels and pouncing on you, and that's the other issue. A white dragon, unlike the other ones, is not too proud to run away. Again, this is something they have in common with black dragons. They're not too proud to leave. Oh, I lost half my HP in one round, I'm out. And they'll just leave. They'll bugger off for a while, then they'll come back and hit you again. And then they'll just start playing that game. They'll play the hit and run game. And they can play that game. Alright, if they've got the right magic, they'll just summon a snowstorm and then just start picking you off one at a time. Hello, you're in a horror movie now! How is that for a fun idea? There's a dragon out here who has taken their lessons on murdering people from Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers. Enjoy that entire idea. Now, if you are not blessed to be a mage, like I am not blessed to be a mage, I mean, we're going to have to go back to pointy sticks. But the issue with pointy sticks is, are you going to get through his hide? Or their hide? I want to single out this guys here. You're just as likely to fight a female white dragon. So, lances, pikes, large
large spears, bills, pole arms in general, probably your best bet if you're going to get it all through those uh, scales. If you don't have that, Roman scorpions. I mean, a Roman scorpion is probably a good bet. It's a pretty big crossbow. It can shoot pretty far. It's got a hell of a lot of stopping power to it. That's something to work with. Other than that, you're going to have to lure it into areas that will limit its mobility. Ugh, good luck with that. I mean, like I said, it can fly, so you're going to have to lure it into a cave. It can swim, so the cave can't have access to water. And it can dig, so the cave has to be made out of a fairly hard rock that it can't just dig through. This is, of course, assuming it does not have the spell transmute stone to mud. Just be aware of that. It may have that. Or fabricate. <clears throat> oh, I'm stuck in a cave and you're going to try to trap me. I'll just fabricate a whole bunch of tiny flat rock disks and those collapse and then I'll just run out the hole. That's a thing you need to be aware of, by the way. If they have good spell selection, this gets wor infinitely worse trying to trap these suckers. So, generally speaking, my advice on when engaging a white dragon, don't, if at all possible. However, if you have to honestly try to outsmart it, but remember, it's very focused on killing things, so it's very good at killing things, or it should be. And it probably knows most of the tricks, so don't try to be too obvious. Secondly, scout that thing out, okay? You figure out what this thing does, you figure out what kind of equipment it has, you figure out what spells it has, if that's at all possible, and really watch out for the controlling options. That thing could be throwing around all sorts of nasty debuffs and control spells to stop you from being able to do much of anything. And you don't want that, because you want to come back alive and that dragon doesn't much care. Now, you're probably wondering, can I talk to it? Can I negotiate with them? I'm going to lean with no. Almost 95% of the time. Because what do you have that it wants? What do you have that that white dragon cares at all about? Remember, they're focused on survival. They are focused on living and continuing to exist. I don't know what you're going to provide that dragon that it can't provide for itself. Now maybe, maybe you got something. Maybe you have a, um, a ring of... The fiery soul, I think it is, or icy soul. The one that makes you immune to fire, but weak to cold. It would totally wear that ring. That ring is great A for it, because it's already immune. Or something else along those lines, something useful for it. But generally speaking, you're going to have to make a heck of an offer. Because it talking to it is difficult. It could just kill you. You walk into its cave, it could just easily decide to eat you. So, be cautious on that one. So everybody, I don't have much to tell you about fighting white dragons, other than restrict its movement, try to outsmart it, and burn it if possible. But, and again, they're very unique, so none of that might work. But, hope you all enjoyed this. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment below if you did. And remember, buddy, you can negotiate with a blue dragon. You can enter a pact with a black dragon. They'll watch your back. You can flatter and otherwise pay proper homage to a green dragon. You can flatter, trick, seduce, or toy with a red dragon. But to a white dragon, you're just mate. And it will treat you accordingly.